Photographic Ethics, Module 5, Ethical Editing. I'm your host, Aubrey P. Graham, and you are will welcome to contact me at aubreygraham at gmail.com. Please note that all images used in these six modules, unless otherwise indicated, were produced by myself. I hold the copyright to the images, and the images cannot be reproduced, copied, shared, or otherwise repurposed without my consent. For questions on how to use any of the images shown here in other contexts, please email me at the address listed. The goals of this ethical editing module are to understand that different images have different uses and should be edited to fit their intentions and the intended narrative, while staying accurate to the situation of their creation. We'll break that down in a little bit. Also, one of the goals is to learn the basics of what can be altered and what should not be altered in a photograph. Further, you will learn about editing software options and about image storage basics. So to start, we want to learn about how to select images for use. To do so, one needs to determine the goal or the use of the photographs. That means asking oneself the question, where will the image be published? Who will see it? What is the goal of the image, i.e., what does it need to say or depict to be successful? What narrative is needed? Does the image reflect the situation in which you took it? So is it representative? Is the composition compelling? Is the narrative between the subject and context clear? Does it tell an easily understandable story? And finally, is the image in line with FETP slash TEFINET ethics and standards? So now that you've asked yourself those questions, we have to think through a couple things to avoid. In general, one wants to avoid the publication of non-representative images. These are photographs that are not accurate or representative of the work done, the population, or the situation. These might be beautiful images or even just interesting images, but they might not have a role in the publication that you've intended. Further, one wants to avoid cliche or stereotypical images. Was the photograph taken because it is recognizable as a stereotypical photograph? One of perhaps the best examples of this is the fly-eyed child photograph. We saw a lot of those in the 1980s and 1990s, and sometimes people will go into the field and take those photographs, again, standing above a child that may or may not be on the ground, may or may not have flies in their eyes, and one takes it because it is recognizable as a photograph. But is that representative, A, of FETP work? And was the photograph taken because it is representative of the situation writ large, or is it, was it taken because it's stereotypical and therefore recognizable? So we want to avoid those. Further, we want to avoid taking insensitive images. These are photographs that are not culturally sensitive regarding gender, age, ability, religion, etc. And a point to make here is that sometimes what is exciting to the photographer's eye as a photographer is not necessarily the best image to provide accurate information about a program, a disease, or people to the targeted audience and publication. And again, this is where gaining consent and letting people know why you're going to take what photos is also quite important. Now moving forward onto you, you've selected your photograph and you found one that is ethical, that is representative, and that you think will tell the desired narrative for the desired publication. Now we need to think about editing that photograph to enhance but not to alter what you see. So ethics are not fixed, but rather they are subjective. You just have to trust your gut in these cases. But a general rule to follow is to enhance the image and not to alter the image. So as you'll see on the left, that is the original image. You've seen this image before in the rule of thirds um, in an earlier webinar, and it is in its absolute original context here as the camera took it. What you see on the right is my edited version. You can see that the darks are darker, the colors are brighter, there's more contrast, the road pops a little bit more, and you see the woman as standing out from the landscape a bit more. I have not added, changed, or taken away anything from this image, but simply worked with what was there with the colors to enhance what exists. And a general rule of thumb for that is anything you can do in a dark room, you can do in editing. And that means changing the contrast, deepening the blacks, heightening the whites, adding a vignette, um, and the like, but it does not mean doing things that Photoshop or Photoshop-like programs are so skilled at in terms of removing elements. 
So color modification is a big part of this. As I just said, deepening the blacks, brightening the, the whites, adding saturation. So color modifications are okay, so long as the image retains the same narrative and meaning as when it was created. We want to be aware with lighting that lighting can make, when it is, makes a scene darker, can imply a more negative tone, while brightening it up can imply positivity. Making sure that your editing is in line with the visual narrative and the representative nature of the photograph is really important. By increasing contrasts, blacks, whites, and slight vibrancy or correcting color, by doing so, this tends to make images compelling and professional looking without changing their meaning. So again, subtle enhancements are okay. So you see here, you have um, Ferdinand who's sitting in his chair, but you can't see the mountains in the background. You can only kind of see that they're there really lightly here, and you've lost a lot of color in the ground. It's kind of blown out. And yet in this one, I was able to, by using uh, shadows and lightening the highlights in Adobe Lightroom, I was able to bring the mountains that exist are in this image, they're just almost gone, bring them back into the image without adding anything. So again, nothing is changed or altered, it's just enhanced. Another way to change an image and to edit an image, and sometimes to remove some of that visual excess, is through cropping. Now, what you have here in this image is you have the whole image all the way out to the edge of the frame, and then you have this darker shading gray area that would be an acceptable crop for this photograph. It would tighten up the frame so that you don't have all the excess out here, the various papers on the desks, and the, I don't know what's hanging over here, perhaps a, um, a paper of planets. So we don't get distracted by that, we tighten up the frame. And that's okay, because the meaning hasn't changed. But to alter the narrative would be a negative thing. So what we see here in the narrative is a happy teacher and mostly happy, engaged students. You can see that they're all kind of smiling, they're looking at each other. It looks like this student here is engaging directly with the instructor. And we see a classroom, we see happy, engaged kids. Too much cropping can give us a different narrative. If we just put a little box around the one student who is looking at the camera or towards the camera, we see that he doesn't look nearly as happy as the other students. And if we cropped only so that we could see him, we would lose the rest of the context and the joy that's so present in this image. And so overcropping or cropping until the narrative changes is not encouraged. Another part of ethical editing is avoiding, and avoiding altering the image. A couple ways that are quite common to alter the image these days are through filters, um, specific filters such as Snapchat or Instagram. We want to try to avoid using those filters. Um, they can alter the faces, the mood, and the composition of the image, um, therefore altering the meaning. So we don't want to do that because you want to keep the meaning accurate to how it was created. Further, we want to avoid adding or removing elements. So certain editing software allows you to add or remove elements, leaving all of the aspects of the image as they are is great, but feel free to enhance them through lighting and color. So while image alteration takes a fair amount of skill, and some people are quite good at these programs of Photoshop and the like, it's nonetheless discouraged in relation to the TefiNet and FETP set of images and a general code of photographic ethics. Keep in mind that enhancing an image is great, but altering it is ethically questionable. So for instance, over here, we have, we're back to that image from the prison that was mentioned in a former webinar. And you can see that I have very quickly added in, in a paint program, a heart DRC. Obviously, I didn't do a very good job with this, and you can tell that it is added in, but it's the idea of discouraging, altering, and adding something to change the meaning. If I added this here, some of this and the various etchings might take on a different tone because of what I've put in there. So don't add anything to the images, don't take people out of them. Generally, just keep it as it is, but enhancements are wonderful. Now, some of the editing software that can provide enhancements are free open source software, such as GIMP, and the link for GIMP is set up here. You also have Google Photos, which does a very basic editing program, and you have Adobe Lightroom or Photoshop, which can be found through adobe.com. So Google Photos, the organization is super basic. It sets up 
images in a timeline. You can see over here, it tells you when you took them um, and it allows you to very easily move through and find them. You can also tag them with various labels. And then when you need to edit them, it gives you a very basic set of options for editing. Adobe Lightroom provides perhaps a bit more complex organization where images are labeled in their folders where they are on your um, desktop on your computer and then within it you can add these flags that tell you oh yes I like this photo so I want to come back to it later there's also a rating system for stars you can put over here you can write in your captions your metadata the names and various things that are um, pertinent to the images themselves and search for them later um, and Adobe Lightroom also has an editing function that can be quite complex. It will tell you what you've done on the left and on the right you can change things that don't alter the photograph but do enhance it. So your exposure, your contrast, your highlights, shadows, whites, blacks, your clarity, vibrance, and saturation. And of course it carries on to a tone curve all the way down to various uh, levels of colors and the vignetting, etc. But this is something that similar softwares are out there and one can play around with that to enhance the photograph so that you have this very visually compelling image. GIMP is an open source software that is akin to Adobe Photoshop. It's easy to access online and as you can see here it comes with this plethora of tools for you to engage the image, to brighten your colors, to alter things. GIMP Photoshop, etc., are spaces um, like paint where you can add text to the image, but you also should be very careful of not altering the image in these spaces. But it's a great free open source software. Now, in terms of storing and organizing your images, it's recommended to store all images on a secure hard drive as well as a backup. Options include Google Drive, iCloud, your organization's server, or a personal hard drive. Double copies of images are important. To retain the image should anything happen to your phone, your computer, your camera, your SD card, etc. Also, it's encouraged to label your folders and images clearly. Don't just write Brazil for every image um, or every folder that came out of a long trip from various cities and towns within the country. Rather, have the date, the organization, the topic, the and the location. Um, that tends to work well to give you an idea. So in this case, it's okay, February 1st, 2019, we have the FETP, it's a vaccination campaign. Brazil, you might even be more specific and say Brazil underscore Sao Paulo. You can get as specific as you need to to help yourself organize. Then, in certain ways, as you could see with Lightroom, it has spaces to enter metadata. Metadata or writing your captions into the images helps the information be saved onto the image itself, which is great when other people are using your image at later points. So things that are useful for metadata include the location of the image, the date, the program name, any individual names and information that you've gained, and any further information about that space or the image. Um, and we will go over that more with captions in Module 6. So image storage is often disorganized, kind of like this. This is just a folder from one of my desktops, and you can see that it's kind of difficult to see where it is and how it works. But again, Lightroom provides this really versatile storage where you can see over here that you can put them into folders, you work with digital copies, um, and it tends to be pretty easy to organize. You can actually move the images around, see them large, see them, see them small. Um, it's a friendly program to work with. So in summary, working through the ethics of image selection and editing is to think through and select the images that are going to tell the best story that you can given what you're trying to represent. Also, image selection is about avoiding sensational or stereotypical images. And ethical editing is about enhancement. It's about the fact that basic editing, the things you can do in a darkroom are okay, and basic cropping is okay, but major alterations that shift the narrative and the accuracy of the story are discouraged. Adding things into the scene, removing things from the scene um, are not the best of ideas. Um, and in summary, providing information and putting it into the images itself while you store it, as well as exploring what forms of photo editing and storage software work for you. Um, there were a bunch of different options that were provided here, but certainly it's not limited. And um, a lot of that is personal, personal preference in terms of what people want to use. So what's up next is our final 
module of photographic ethics on the ethics of image captions.